everybody, my name is Luke Moore and this is Hot La Mode and today on Hot La Mode we are going to be talking about London Fashion Week. Now listen, there is a lot going on in the world of fashion month, designers showing collections, albeit with no audiences, designers just putting out lookbooks that, you know, they've never really done previously for a mainstay, a spring-summer season. There's a lot going on, and so we've already discussed New York Fashion Week. If you're looking for that video, it's somewhere here, and the link will be in the description box below. But we're going to be getting on to our second leg of the race, which is London. So let's get it started. And we're going to be starting with none other than the big kahuna of the week, Burberry. Ricardo Tichy's Burberry has been an enigma since he started. He wanted to mix high-end luxury with the street. His fashion shows have had large budgets, but the sets nor models produce anything that most would remember, and the clothing just always feels like the strangest TikTok layering challenge the world has seen. And this season, it's all culminated in a collection that Tichy has called his strongest, but still leaves the mind wondering what exactly was strong. The very first thing Tichy should have done when reimagining Burberry in his image should have been to reinvent the iconic trench coat so that it spoke to the modern person. No offense, but that still hasn't happened two and a half years later. Nor has a denim vest trompe l'oeil effect on a beige trench coat done that in the slightest. Tichy mentioned something about this collection being a mixture of a shark and a mermaid, which might explain the high high-low knit sweater and double waistband pants that styled together feels like an open shark's mouth in my mind. Also, while we're still on the subject, how did we continue the layered waistband styles? What is the point of it? More barriers to have to break down when you're desperate to go to the toilet? Another stab at the trench coat with a denim vest trump way is spiced up with leather sleeves. And I mean, listen, there are lots of spices. This one is Italian seasoning and it's not particularly spicy. You couldn't pay me to wear that coat, let alone get me to actually pay for it. The trench coat style is continued, but this one was a Neapolitan of leather, khaki, and blue denim. But again, while it's a new take on the trench coat, it's not particularly interesting, nor is it something that would seem to reinvigorate Burberry customers to want to adopt it. Another trench coat in a patent blue leather with a crop jacket overlay was nice, but will it get customers to buy? I hope so but hope only goes so far. A sleeveless trench coat printed with a blue serpent-like coil allowed a eye-printed t-shirt to be seen. These are styles that could help to elevate the trench coat and take it from Edwardian English gent to a more approachable style for the people of 2020. Another blue trench coat in a wrinkly cotton has its chest compressed with a blue and silver fishnet top, which is actually quite chic. Is it really that wearable? I'll have to see one of the Burberry ambassadors like Hunter Schaefer to make Make that decision, but I could easily see it becoming a full beach trend. A men's trench coat is actually fitted quite well, and its less lengthy cut actually makes it more of a jacket than a coat, but adding in a hoodie might help to make it more appealing for those looking to wear it in the rain. I might be speaking out of my ass here, but Thomas Burberry couldn't have been that smart if he invented a trench coat and was from England, where it always fucking rains and didn't add a hood. Somebody explain that one. A black leather trench coat with cotton sleeves and capelet was another smart little take on the Burberry classic and sort of proves that the Burberry check doesn't need to be part of everything. The green printed turtleneck dress with a gathered skirt and circular patches that are twisted at the breasts was strange. Maybe Tishi thought the breast patches the twisted fabric that resembled pointed nipples tried to be a Gautier cone bra moment, but unfortunately falls really, really flat. Overalls seem to be quite commonplace this season for Burberry. Maybe it's the fact that some of the world's wealthiest have scuttled away to the countryside as soon as the pandemic hit. To be honest, it's hard not to associate such a style with Marie Antoinette's famous robe de gaulle, which was a simple white cotton dress she wore within Versailles when she wanted to play a peasant. Is that the Burberry vibe? I'm not sure, but does anybody know how to say let them eat cake in Italian? While the printed shirt is hideous and the overall top falling over the pants is very Ricardo for Burberry, my heart desires to see sexy men wear fishnet shirts like these with skimpy little speedos. As the comments on TikTok say, I would respectfully look. An orange high-low trench coat feels again like a new take on the Burberry signature style and something that could possibly entice a younger clientele. Possibly. 
A Burberry Circle logo, which was developed by Tishi, was partially seen on a white dress with white lace sash and hem trim, and was covered by an orange leather coat. Even when somewhat simple pieces are paired together, Burberry doesn't feel terribly desirable in my opinion. Another overall look appeared, although this one was deconstructed, and utilized snaps to create leg cutouts. The button down with the skin exposed above the inner elbow and fishnet shirt underneath confuses me. I understand it's meant to have a cool layering effect, but wearing a fishnet shirt underneath my button down seems like an extra dressing step I would refuse to take when all I do is dress up at home. Tishi's famed prints, which in the past have been everything from Bambi to Rottweilers to dead creepy Victorian children, is explored here. It's actually kind of interesting. What looks like a portrait model has her face covered in seashells in an almost disturbing manner and maybe a reference back to Tishi's heavily pierced models from his Givenchy days, which honestly is a look I still dream about and has had me genuinely considering getting a nose ring at certain points in my life. Another portrait face is covered in butterfly wings behind an almost equally disturbing image, but I think it's lovely and charming and I hope that these kinds of prints are adapted to more accessible items like t-shirts and hoodies, because there might be hope for Burberry yet. A draped cocktail version of the previous gown adds a bit of flu to the mix. The asymmetrical drape actually creates an interesting texture and further morphs the print. I don't know how many of these maritime looks will actually shed but I'll be watching. That was dumb, I know, but I enjoyed it and I had to write it. A leather and wool like men's look with coat and leather pants actually feels interesting, but quite heavy for a spring summer collection. I'm sorry, are none of these designers noticing that like the whole planet is warming up? Nobody? Okay, just checking. Another wool and leather coat is placed over a pleated sheer black dress with curly lettuce hems. Again, I'm confused as to why we are showing such heavy pieces for spring summer. A white version of the black sheer dress we just saw is unfortunately covered by a fishnet coat in silver and blue. I mean, the coat isn't unfortunate, I just wish the dress was given a chance to shine more. The coat is actually dazzling and a lovely way to showcase the fishnet style in my opinion. It's brilliant to see how the actual netting goes from dark to transparent depending on the fabric it's overlaid on. The bag is also lovely and could help bring transparent bags back into the limelight. A printed t-shirt, not like the shell face ones that were actually deserving of some t-shirt love, has cutouts at the breasts. The netting underneath covers the breasts and is actually kind of cool, but the cutouts don't feel smart or even brilliant like Regina George's iconic ones from Mean Girls. Instead, it just feels tacky and strange. If you're gonna do breast cutouts, make them a bit less shock factor and more about transforming how society feels about an exposed breast. Again, Tishi's prints can be really jarring and creative and thought-provoking. These sort of scribble prints that are so chock full of motifs and illustrations doesn't deliver any of the interest he is actually known for. Even the men's cutout styles feel dumb, and I genuinely can't understand why anyone would wear overalls under their t-shirt. I also need to know how logistically the overall came under the t-shirt on one side, but over it on the other. Another sheer pleated and printed dress has its print extended over a simple jacket. It's actually a cool idea, although I would hope that the pieces themselves showcase the full print by themselves, but the styling here is really smart. A cable knit sweater bolero and dress is quite sweet and the way the lace of the dress and bolero are cut, it looks like a little heart, and well, that I can get behind, I guess. A black leather trench coat in a high-low cut exposes a pleated lace dress underneath, but Tishi's layering can be quite confusing. It often needs editing because it's hard to discern what the pieces actually look like. A sheer knit dress with sleeves and lettuce hem details is sweet and definitely has the sportswear vibe Tishi has always embedded into his work. The strips of fabric that emulate boning also showcase Case that there is some form of regality still alive in what he does. A peplum style top has a knit bolero and is placed over stitched jeans with brown thigh highs. Honestly, it looks like everything that could possibly go wrong with the high street did so. A white version of the high-low jacket has a longer length than the black version, which gives it a little bit more room to breathe. Although the look is still very busy underneath and the thigh-high boots throughout the collection are sometimes ill-advised, 
it definitely works better here. An oversized black shirt with white deconstructed collar and placket is styled over a pair of crystal grid pants, which we first saw during the Spring 2020 collection. The grids of crystals are layered on top of each other and have circular cutouts at the knees and thighs as well as zippers, which probably allows the wearer a bit more customization, but I'd like to know how much profit the crystal grid styles actually bring to the company. A crystal grid polo shirt is actually quite nice, but I mean, who was ever really desired a crystal grid polo shirt. Unless rich people start playing polo matches on unicorns, I can't exactly see it taking off. The collection finished out with three sheer crystal grid dresses, some quite lovely, others quite hideous. The first was a simple fitted cocktail dress with that asymmetrical shoulder drape detail that we saw earlier. While the drape doesn't have the same flow it did with other fabrics, it definitely has a Greco-Roman warrior vibe, which might tie back into Tishi's Italian heritage. Besides from the asymmetrical gathering on its right side and the hip, it's a smart dress that could do well for more adventurous customers. A simple cocktail dress follows. I mean, the dress is simple, but the fringe of the crystals that sloppily falls from the collar is disturbing. I believe it's meant to be a fringe on the sleeves, but alas, that's lost in translation here and just looks like a crystallized glob of fabric and adornments. The finale dress has a stronger asymmetrical drape than the previous one, but while I'm usually not a fan for the lack of ability of arm movement, here it feels like a doubling down of that Greco-Roman warrior, which in the middle of a pandemic, whatever fantasy gets you through, I'm not judging. All in all, this is far from Ricardo Tichy's strongest work. There are pieces that definitely pique interest and feel reminiscent of his world-renowned work from Givenchy, but unfortunately, it's few and far between. Next up, Simone Rocha. Simone Rocha is a designer constantly creating her own worlds that her customers can comfortably slip into. After what some may have seen as a rough season, me, she's blown through with a collection full of signature styles with large boisterous shapes and rich fabric and textile choices. The collection opened with an oversized short suit in black and crystal bust encrustment and poof sleeves. In a world marred by social distancing, putting a bit of space between her customers and others seems like a really caring thing for Rosha to do. A strapless black silk gown is in a layer of knots and is draped in an easily reminiscent way of Balenciaga's double balloon look that consisted of two dramatic layers in an evening gown and cape. Rocha pulling from the master of silhouette is a welcome thing in my mind, as bold shapes is something she's become quite known for. Her droopy bows deliver a more feminine aesthetic to me, but nonetheless, a lovely little ode. Now, while Rocha doesn't nearly get the respect and praise she deserves for her tail, Tailoring, probably because it falls outside the Savile Row aesthetic of bespoke suiting, it's always nice to see. A black silk knotted cape created a pear shape with only a tailored pant platform sandal, and caged pearl bag being seen. It's just the house codes of Rocha being perfectly placed together to create mystery, but also defiance of what is expected of female designers. An A-line chiffon coat is embroidered with images of flowers and castles, which is placed over a A-line short suit with printed version of the flowers and castles. A bold silhouette with delicate embroidery and motifs turned into a suit is the style in which Rocha thrives, and this look is no different. A floral brocade dress with droopy bow to create extra shape at the hips could be interesting, but is thrown off by the asymmetry of the bow. I mean, most people don't tie perfect bows, and if you do, well, goody for you. But if I'm paying upwards of $1,000 for a bow on a dress, it better be goddamn symmetrical. The crystal bra that matches to the caged pearl bag, though, they can stay. Another great example of Rocha's tailoring is shown here in a navy blue coat that's puff sleeves and structure doesn't crush the delicate chiffon and embroidered skirt or dress underneath. While I've said it multiple times this season, I'm confused by the multitude of heavy coats that we are seeing due to the fact that climate change is a thing. A simple take on a raincoat though, which is what I assume is going on here, makes sense though, as Rocha is based in the UK and stems from Ireland, which are equally rainy places. A bias cut charmoose dress is quite hideous, but I find the idea of layering it over a simple v-neck long sleeve shirt or sweater very interesting. These kinds of bias cut dresses that adhere to the body quite closely were made popular by the movie stars of the 1930s, but Rocha has reinvented them by allowing them to have a less formal feel. If she could perfect the bias cut gown so it looks a bit more refined in terms of stitching, it would brilliantly 
reinvigorate the style of her customers in 2020. A pale blue chiffon layered dress with red castle embroidery pulls interest because of its asymmetry. That reminds me of Rei Kawakubo's iconic Lumps and Bumps collection. It's not as dynamic, but the use of the fabric definitely creates an odd shape. But the tied ribbons along the torso and waist aren't terribly desirable. A cocktail dress version of the silk knotted dress has visible straps here, and while I can appreciate a more casual version of the dress, the asymmetry still feels odd at best. A simple black brocade dress showcases floral motifs bumping through the crystal pipe dress. A white collared shirt continues to showcase a brand staple in tailoring, but Roshaw's ability to mix masculinity and femininity in such a bouffant manner showcases Roshaw's innovative take on dressing. What looks like a brocade skirt and cropped bra top set is the background to Rocha's bags that the brand no doubt wants to keep in the forefront of the customer's mind. An elegant gold brocade dress with that pannier shape is luscious to see. A simpler version of the dress puts the majority of the focus on the stitching because it's so visible, but here the motif and colors mask the stitching, but still allow it to showcase a ripple effect as if the dress's surface is moving in a similar motion to waves. Another A-line style, this time in what looks like Simone's take on the three-piece suit. Through the use of the button-down shirt, skirt instead of vest, and tailored pants is covered in red floral motifs. We saw a similar style during her spring 2020 collection. The motif is definitely different as the circular pattern here has an S interlocked with an R, but I assume the update comes because it was a successful style from the spring 2020 show, a smart move for Rocha's business in the middle of a pandemic. An A-line brocade coat and short set with cotton torso overlay with a crystal bust, might I add, can be seen as ridiculous to the untrained fashion eye. But if you understand Rocha's use of silhouette as a buffer and her mixing of masculine and feminine sensibilities through clothing, it almost seems normal. Something about the cotton torso overlay almost feels like a play on the traditional corset Western women have been accustomed to wearing throughout time. But Rocha here brings it to the front, almost laughing at its ridiculousness, at least that's how I see it. A white button-down dress at the top of the thigh flows into a transparent chiffon that showcases the layers of tulle underneath, almost actively deconstructing the garment. A crystal cage crop top and handful of Rocha pearl bags accentuate the regality of the look. An almost fully sheer white dress is covered in black floral embroidery that looks so delicately done. The fabric underneath the skirt helps to showcase and create shape in the skirt, and while the torso utilizes the same embroidery, it takes the ribbon detail from earlier and puts it to good use as it backs up the black embroidery quite nicely. A white version of the knitted bow dress creates a cape shape that covers the shoulders, which is more reminiscent of the Balenciaga looks we discussed earlier. And the bow at the waist does create more shape at the hips as well. In reality, it's a lighter version than the previous installations, and I think the white allows a bit more give with the asymmetry of the bows. The collection rounded out with another white caped bow look, this time in singularity. It flowed down around Tess McMillan and created an angelic contrary to Balenciaga's double balloon silhouette, maybe paving the way for Roshan to know that there is possibly light at the end of this tunnel. This season was a tour to force for Simone Rocha. Her and her team delivered a collection that was quintessentially Rocha Ian, and it was quite nice to see a strong collection from a familiar face. Just to note, while all these male designers like Kim Jones and Matthew Williams are thrown keys to some of the most iconic and historic houses in fashion, I wonder why designers like Rocha have not been given such opportunities. While most designers have done anything but throw caution to the wind, Molly Goddard has seemingly doubled down on promoting her tool fantasies and abstract fabric manipulations in the middle of the COVID crisis. Maybe that's a strong point for an independent brand to have. Now, Goddard's debut look for the collection is truly a fuck you to the idea of making clothing clients could see themselves easily wearing during a pandemic, at least in my opinion. A neon green and black checkerboard jacket layered over a neon pink striped t-shirt 
over a gigantic red tulle skirt and orange bag is what we get. My initial thought is confusion, but I wonder if all of this color and pattern has a deeper meaning? I hope so. The checkerboard jacket is back with striped top and green ruffle skirt underneath, but has a synthetic feeling to it. Goddard, if working with less voluminous pieces, needs to make them more dynamic and more reflective of her brand. This look doesn't either. The yellow shower loofah top isn't too bad. It actually creates a beautiful symmetrical shape that looks like a soft cloud I'd like to sleep on. The gingham skirt with ruffles and smaller gingham panels is more confusing though. I guess the bag in this case is a way for Goddard to embed her signature ruffle technique into accessories? Normally, Goddard usually saves her mountainous tulle dresses for the end of her shows, but here a pleasant yellow dress reassures clients that the tulle style isn't going anywhere, even if you have nowhere to go. I mean, if Villanelle from Killing Eve can go to therapy in one, you can watch Netflix on the couch in one. A more fitted A-line dress that's printed with floral details perfectly falls above the knee and showcases that Goddard's not afraid to pattern her signature tulle. Another floral printed tulle dress is mixed with yellow polka dots and adding a waist peplum didn't help. Goddard's tulle pieces are so dynamic that adding a print of any sort must be perfectly executed, otherwise the watered down motif will only water down her gorgeous dresses as well. And yellow polka dots with boring florals? Come on, Molly. White and black shin-length dresses are both quite simple, except for the subtle layered details above the hem. Goddard, while definitely showcasing loud pieces this season, seems to want to tap into a more demure clientele as well. The dresses unfortunately aren't very special and really need to read a bit more Goddard. Without that, they look like any old dress off the rack. The striped t-shirt is layered under a white spaghetti strap gown with layers of ruffles in an attempt at making Goddard's dresses more casual. I would casually deny that combination though. Another tulle top is layered over a woven cardigan with ruffles peeking out from under the hem. Confusion ensues when floral printed jeans show up in the look as they feel more Etsy than luxury. A lovely pink shin length dress with spaghetti straps has a beautiful bust that ought to be examined. It feels like shirring, but done in pleated layers and the intricacy of the layers of fabric really reminds me of Sfogliatelle, the intricate Italian pastry. Goddard brilliantly transitions her voluminous dresses into a flowing white shirt here. The bust detail is almost identical to Goddard's dress busts, but a sleeve and shoulder strap perfectly brings the garments into top territory. The jeans, while I understand help to make the look more casual, still throw me off. A black gown with pleated shirring bust and shirring details at the hips is lovely, a classic for Goddard and just nice to see. Goddard stripped down bralette and shorts with matching knee highs is something different. Maybe Goddard is experimenting with the other end of the fashion spectrum, from gigantic ball gown styles all the way to everyday athletic wear. If it works, I'm happy to see it, but I'm more intrigued if her customers will bite. Something about the ruffle placement on this gown feels very Shakespearean. And it's not a good thing. And another lovely pink tulle gown arrives, this time with sleeves, and is just another breathtaking little classic. The brilliance of the shirring on the skirt helps to create almost Godet-like styles that seem to bounce and bob around. A green cardigan layered over a cream tulle poof skirt is signature Goddard, and another way that Goddard is trying to reinforce her brand DNA to make it semi-wearable. Nobody on your Thursday Zoom call will know you're wearing a gigantic tulle skirt, but that's not important because you will. An asymmetrical strap dress has a fitted tool overlay that below the waist starts to detach from the dress and create a secondary skirt. It's a different approach from playing with tool and could definitely be interpreted as experimenting with the signature fabric. Refining the straps and fabric flowers could definitely go a long way though. Waves of black tool on an asymmetrical strap dress are bountiful, and if only the straps were symmetrical, I would be in love. Goddard's attempt at an extreme baby doll silhouette in tool is a smashing success. Stirring at the bust is visible and the way the tool scrambles to lay on top of itself is amazing. Like, 
amazing. Separated, these individual pieces might possibly work, but together it just looks like a hideous clusterfuck of ideas, though. A deep red tulle top is lovely, and it's paired over a crisp white dress with tulle manipulated details. And when they're layered on top of each other, it's a striking use of color and color blocking. The finale gown is a simple sheer bodice with straps and lovely dark stitches, and a bright red chrysanthemum style skirt that we've seen multiple times throughout the collection. It's deep, it's bold, and it's very easy to get lost in the texture of the tool. Molly Goddard stuck to her outlandish guns this season, and while most brands plan to strip down and focus on pieces that might be more commercial, Goddard took a different route. I respect her stance, and I hope it resonates with her customer. Next up, let's talk about Christopher Kane. Now, Christopher Kane is one of London's most quirky minds, and this season he took on painting, something from his childhood that he revisited during COVID as inspiration. In the way only Christopher Kane can, he presents paint prints in an abstract manner that makes us ponder the idea of walking art. A beautiful long-sleeved full-skirted dress is covered in a rainbow of abstract paint marbling, splattered on top of beautiful marbling and squiggles of glitter dripped all around the dress. The motif really is a lovely take on interpreting art, and the silhouette of the dress only bolsters it by adding rigidity and reality. I think this is a dress every big shot gallerist in the world needs. A jacket and skirt version of the marble paint effect with glitter is just as brilliant. The excess fabric on the jacket created a a large cuff that added a completely new shape to the coat. The idea of the paint motif as separate could help clients also feel they have more ability to mix and match the styles, which might make them a bit more prone to purchasing. A crudely painted black shirt showcases Christopher's name, and it's paired over a painted skirt with glitter. Now, I don't know if Kane plans to sell the t-shirt seen here, but creating custom-made ones that have his new slogan, More Joy, in the painted style would actually be a really smart idea. If he made a limited stock and painted them himself, I'm sure dedicated fans would definitely want a piece. What looks like a high bateau neckline dress reiterates Kane's interest in painting, and the red glitter resembles blood to those in a spooky October mindset, aka me. An interesting thing to note about the glitter used from Kane's collection is that at one point during his quarantine painting extravaganza, the art stores started to run out of paint, meaning that Kane had to start buying glitter instead, which led to styles like this. Normally, glitter seems a bit tacky, but Kane throughout this collection most definitely upped its status as a material that could be used in fashion. A marbled paint coat and skirt appeared doused in glitter, which was another strong look with a stronger sense of orange throughout. A jacket with cuffed hem and skirt is covered in glitter as well, and the use of pink, purple, and blue is a sweet use of color coordination. Another high bateau neckline dress has its neckline outlined with a black border. It's probably meant to imitate the canvas on the easel sitting next to the model. Model, but the way the black piping helps to create a shape at the waist is a bit of a subtle detailing that ought to be acknowledged. While the idea of paint strokes isn't exactly original, when it comes to fashion and textiles, Kane's use of the strokes to create stripes was a smart yet professional style, and at the same time made the quite boring motif a bit more creative. While many are stuck at home and might be working from home for the time being, there still is some form of professionalism when it comes to dress that must be followed on occasion. For those looking to be a bit more adventurous, taking classic blue and white stripes and giving them a bit more grit through the use of paint motifs feels like a fun way to express yourself in the new world we're all living in. A white button-up shirt with black placket is paired over a striped skirt, probably another reference to Kane's newfound love of the arts and crafts material. The skirt looks to be some sort of chainmail of pink and red and might be something clients want, but it doesn't exactly seem like it'll be put to good use during the time as a waist down piece won't get the shine that they used to pre-COVID. I mean, listen, it's the same thing as Molly Goddard. If you want to wear it, you want everybody to know, go for it. Kane took on another corporate casual style in a blue button down shirt and added small paint stripes throughout. A simple leather mini skirt is covered in glitter paint strokes and again references Kane's newfound love of the material. In reality, it's not terribly innovative, but could be an interesting commercial aspect to the collection. A pink and mustard glittery chainmail top is paired with a simple black blue skirt 
all in stripes. It's smart of Kane to showcase above waist glitter pieces, as again, it might get some compliments on your Google Meets meeting. A dress version of the black and blue stripes is nice, but paired with a deconstructed glitter stripe skirt, it doesn't really feel like the smartest way to finish off an otherwise quite strong but small collection. Overall, quality over quantity worked in Christopher Kane's favor this season. Having a personal collection to his materials and motifs also made it more dynamic, and the utilization of the styles helped to add another notch in Kane's strange yet brilliant belt. Next up, let's discuss Robert One. I'm so very excited to discuss our next collection as it's the first time we're going to be reviewing the work of the designer Robert One. One made a name for himself with his orchid shapes that burst forth from his clothing and his strong rigid pleating and silhouettes that feel like they crash landed from space. Looking at his spring summer 2021 collection is like looking at superheroes and supervillains costumes and well never have I ever wanted to be in the pages of a comic book so badly. The opening look of the collection consists of a black top that has been folded onto itself in what one often calls petals. Redefining florals in a more sculptural and 3D essence is essential to one's brand and something that truly makes them stand out from the crowd. A pair of jersey or wool pants have what look like long suspender loops, although I doubt one's clients are looking for pants with suspenders. A split hem pant also has loops that also double as petals that come up from the side and disappear behind the pants. I don't know the actual wearability of one's work, but it's undeniable that it's unlike anything you've ever seen before. A blue and black denim suit utilizes those same folds to create four petals, with blue ones falling down the front and two black ones falling down as surrogate sleeves. These folds also create a collar while cutouts expose the stomach and cleavage. One also shot the top from the back, highlighting in an almost backless detail, except for the waterfall of straps clipped onto different aspects of the jacket. The pants, which are far simpler than the jacket, because well, a Rubik's Cube compared to this jacket would seem very simple, have a split hem with folds that loops up on both sides. They're lovely and could definitely be a more commercial piece for one. A black top with similar petals from look one has what look like straps, except they fall down the front of the top to the shins. A paneled skirt skirt has folds in black and white which are layered over each other on both sides, which adds shape without adding bulk. The black and white petal ankles do make me laugh though. One takes on business attire, but obviously in his own way. A stripped button down shirt is remixed and remastered in a floral folds down the front of the shirt, the sides, and of course, the sleeves. Well, yes, it probably won't fit through the narrow doors of your office or the narrow mindset of what corporate culture deems appropriate clothing. It's an expansion on our norm, and I for one love to see it. A folded black double-breasted coat dress feels like an interesting way to take on a classic coat, and the folded moiré sleeves underneath give the look a more refined feel, while letting it be known that there isn't a garment from one that won't be dripping in his aesthetic. We should also note that one debuted a new take on his classic stone boot, most likely named for the thick choice of a heel. Here, a scrappy sandal-like style is probably meant to entice customers who will have to bear warmer climates. We get to see another coat dress, this time in a khaki that looks as if two coats had once been one, but had become divided by one's folds. The details of the wrap around sleeves, wrap up front, and fall down strap bottom are so quirky and weird weird and somewhat undescribable. Maybe I'm just stupid. Which, listen, I mean, that's not exactly a lie. But certain designers' work is so different from what we are used to that it becomes incredibly difficult to describe. One is one of those designers. A very funny story that I do enjoy is that when Cristobal Balenciaga was still an up-and-coming designer in the 1940s, many couldn't figure out how to write about Balenciaga's radical new styles, so they just wrote that his work was Spanish. I won't describe Robert One as Hong Kongese, but it's gonna take some time to find words that really do describe his work accurately. A heavily stitched corset top that is made from panels creates a flared effect, which has been attributed to One's use of seam allowance and how this fabric interacts with it. The pants are definitely ugly, like a Jenko jean that is thoroughly upset with itself and is trying to shed its 1990 image, but the way the strips of fabric almost look like they're being pulled down to expose a black pan underneath is fascinating. Still ugly, but fascinating. 
A dress in black leather is covered by a brown wool bolero with folded sleeves, straps that fall down the sides, and folded collar. The idea of a bolero is interesting, but I'd like to see it connected to something a bit more casual, because I'd wear one with a beautifully fitted Robert One jean. The black leather dress the bolero covers is exquisite. From the stitching, you can see how one can mold leather to create these beautiful ridges of glossy material. The back showcases a strung corset laced and exposing a beautiful aspect of the back if you enjoy that part of yourself. An all red look is marked firstly with another stitched corset with flared peplum panels. A pleated skirt is the first time we see one of one's signatures this collection, and the skirt over a pair of pants has cutouts that make it almost look like it's hanging from a loop, almost like the straps throughout this collection. A pair of oversized front pleated pants with split hems channels a bit of Peter Doe, whose pleated skirts over pants seem to have become a strong trend recently. One has been putting pleated skirts over pants for quite some time as well, but this particular style does feel a bit reminiscent of Doe. The long pleated handbag though, she's new, and proves one isn't just a one trick pony. Probably the best look from this collection is a denim suit filled with folds and petals in blue and gold. The top of course has the folded sleeves, but accentuated with golden zippers, and the way the curvature of the hem of the jacket folds back into the armpits is truly terrifying and also somewhat octopusian. Naturally folded straps fall down from the jacket or waist of the pants and another pair of double slit hem folded pants emerge. The back detail of the look with the lace up exposed back is just another fucking stunning moment. This is fashion porn people, you gotta be 18 and up to legally be looking at this shit. A black leather bomber with folded sleeves plays directly onto a skirt that folds its petals back into itself, although here it kind of reminds me of the curved shoes of an elf. Listen, I don't know how that's desirable, but hey, whatever floats your boat, or I don't know, piddles your petals. The leather leg warmers that fold onto themselves though, they're funny, they can stay. A taupe skirt suit fully of folds creates a more concrete pedal experience. The top's ability to have loops but not be seen through helps to create more of a realistic view of an orchid or flower. The skirt has pedals and panels in and of itself, and the folded leg warmer fest continues. A fan pleated piece of fabric seems to be hot glued onto a simple black bodice, and below the knee, a black pleated skirt with train fans out. The model holds another pleated bag, although this one has a bit more of a utilitarian length. This black and white checkerboard look that's half folds and half pleats is messy. The majority of one's work so far feels so precise and detailed, and trying to bring together multiple styles in a mishmash like this doesn't seem to be his strong suit. Honestly, most designers, it's not their strong suit. An almost fully pleated look is light and airy and sort of creates a waterfall of the heat manipulated fabric. We start with a harness of sorts that has a pink pleated cape that falls down to the model's hips. A structured vest is attached to a high low cut panel of pleats that covered a beige pleated skirt. A pair of oversized pants holds the rest of the look, but the importance lies with the pleats. The pleats continue in a cascading manner with a pleated shawl style top, then a structured vest looking top in a turquoise whose high-low pleats expose a purple skirt underneath. The pleated white oversized pants complete the look and have some sort of fanning out effect at the floor, which is interesting, but I couldn't see it not getting dirty. The finale look of the collection has been described by one as quote, birds of paradise, which would explain the explosion of bright colors. I can't actually decipher what pieces are separates except for the purple skirt, but the green capelet with yellow over vest and red vest over a blue pleated top feels like another cascading of pleats, but feels like there's so much to process, I'd rather look somewhere else. What looks like pants are actually a skirt that utilizes a double train, which is brilliant, but I want to see it in person because I need to know how a double train skirt works. Overall, Robert One is one to watch. His work is difficult to describe and to decipher, but at the same time, that's what a good designer whose work doesn't have easily accessible reference points does. To not pay attention to Robert would be a disservice to you.
Finally, let's talk about J.W. Anderson. Jonathan Anderson, who is the founder of J.W. Anderson, is a designer that we love to watch. His work is kooky and nutty and oftentimes clothing that you really have to sit with in order to really form an informed decision. Anderson found inspiration in Oscar Wilde's thought that, quote, the secret of life is in art. His cutout models against graphic backdrops might make them hard to see, but the collection was full of a demure energy we don't often get a look at for J.W. Anderson. The collection begins with a silky white top with billowing sleeves and a pair of oversized white pants to match the pool at the floor. A belt skirt of sorts printed with white flowers changes up the pace of the look as it creates extra shape. It's not miraculous, but I'm willing to play along. A yellow asymmetrical cape top is confusing and not in the confusing yet attractive way J.W. Anderson usually presents odd garments. The oversized cargo shorts with utility pockets does not help the look, but nothing could really help a look that seems like it's being eaten by itself. Legit, give it two googly eyes and bam, cannibalistic sock puppet. A chevron extravagant appears through a top and skirt combo. A large pearl necklace holds up a beige textured chevron top with a chevron cut hem. And listen, the idea of a pearl necklace from J.W. Anderson who put out dick key rings is not lost on me. The skirt in a muted blue has the same chevron texture that must be some sort of heat press technique, also with a chevron cut hem. To the sides of the hips on the skirt is an excess fabric that creates shapes, giving the look one of the quirky silhouettes Anderson is known to do, but it's not quirky enough to make me enjoy it. Even Anderson can't escape the need to make somewhat commercial pieces in the midst of financial insecurity. A simple black dress, at least for Anderson, is held up by a silver pearl necklace that has a dark strapless torso that is slightly pulled. The skirt is a lighter black, making the difference between the two quite noticeable, and the slight bubble hem is sweet, I guess. It's very strange seeing Jonathan try to do normal, because I guess it's not our idea of normal. It's not really normal for him to do normal, if that makes sense. Black and white silk dresses have some sort of strange floral motif woven into them. I mean, I applaud Anderson's lack of normal florals because odd, spooky, and downright creepy looking flowers are much more interesting in my opinion. The drape that emanates from the pearl bangle in the center of the dress, though, is very strange. Almost as if the dress is going through a rebellious phase and trying to give its mother a heart attack by getting a no piercing. But maybe that's a bit of brand DNA poking through as Anderson's famous pierce bag is known for looking a bit like a bull's nose ring. A white dress then emerges with silver embroidered details at the bust that falls down in a slim triangle shape in the front of the dress. Troubling placement to say the least, and the puffy bubble hem style skirt doesn't really help here. A silky white asymmetrical top is business in the front and party flow in the back, which is actually lovely. The subtle embroidery is a bit disturbing at first, but has been growing on me. I'm gonna keep focusing on the top because I want to turn a blind eye to the ruffle skirt. A green a green military inspired coat falls to the shin and has a lovely detail in the pocketed sleeves. Although I guess the sleeves are non-functional. I hope to be proved wrong on that though, because I do hope that Anderson has created some utility throughout this coat with more than just two pockets. The simple black pants paired under the coat is a smart way to allow a nice coat to take center stage. The silver embroidery motif continues on a yellow sleeveless top. Normally I'm not one for belts, but the the silver tassel belt that must be attached to the top is quite nice and ties in well with the rest of the top, although I'm not sure of the gray ostrich feather tips. The cargo shorts re-emerge and again allow the top to do the talking, which considering the waste up nature of the world and professional appointments nowadays, it's not a bad way to go about creating clothes. A white version of the simple black dress we saw earlier is actually lovely. The difference in shade is not nearly as noticeable and allows the focus to be on the silhouette of the dress. I'm actually noticing the extension of the skirt a few inches out here, but I wish I didn't have to see the tan belt. Another black dress allows the shoulder details to take the wheel, which luckily shields us from the shade differentiation between top and skirt. Now, I can't tell if the asymmetry of the sleeves is just for asymmetry's sake or in a bid to show clients the look's multifaceted styles, but I hope it's for the latter. 
Now, maybe I'm just feeling spooky ooky because it's October, but this pumpkin orange sleeveless dress with a semi-high-low cut and perforated motif is giving the great pumpkin Jonathan Anderson. I'm not mad about a pumpkin dress whatsoever, though. A beautiful black jacket with silk oversized lapels that fall in some sort of cape is the type of garment reconstruction I expect from Anderson, and I'm happy to see it come to fruition. A simple white shirt flows from underneath this interesting jacket, and a cargo short reinstates the jacket being the main focus, thank God. Listen, I never thought I'd be thanking God for cargo shorts, but J.W. Anderson does weird things to me. A suede trench coat with dramatic collar and loosely tied belt is a quite simple style from Anderson, but no doubt one that might pique the interest of those looking to invest in quality pieces in the midst of economic uncertainty. On the other side, are suede trench coats terribly useful, especially with Anderson's brand being based in the UK where rain is not just certain, but tradition? I'm not sure. Another trench coat comes in military green, although its dramatic triangle collar and gathered excess fabric held together by a sizable belt helps it to stand out from the previous version. Suede is back, this time in an asymmetrical blue top, but looks less like a Sesame Street character eating the khaki cargo shorts underneath it. So. I guess we should be grateful. A beige version of the pocket sleeve military coat is just as strong, and the use of the simple black pants reinstates that the focus should be on the jacket exclusively. The silky fabric we saw earlier with strange floral motifs woven in was divine in two funky short suits. The pink allowed us to accurately see the dramatic proportions of the flare hem of the jacket, while the matching cargo shorts help to bolster the shape of the suit. The white version is just as good, although the shape of the suit is a bit more streamlined in the white, and its ability to hide the stitch and fabric change at the waist is great as well. The pattern silk continues on with a billowing sleeve top that is constricted below the bust by a pair of sweetly tailored high-waisted pants. It's a rather lovely look that combines nice tailoring and sensuality of draped fabric that flows, and for that I can applaud Anderson. A white version of the perforated pumpkin dress from earlier appears and is nice as it allows us to see a bit more of details on the dress. A high semi-ruffled turtleneck collar is a dazzling little detail not really noticed on the first look. The final coat of the collection is just another example of how almost every designer that took on the trench coat made it far more interesting than Ricardo Tichy at Burberry, whose job it is to make the fucking trench coat interesting. While the loose collar detail is perplexing, I'll chalk it up to being a quirky Anderson-ism. But the belted waist that creates a nipped-in waist that allows the buildup of fabric to create exaggerated hip details with pockets is lovely. Another example of Anderson mixing masculine and feminine fashion tropes in a way that blurs the line of who his customer is supposed to be. We finish off the collection with vertical zigzag stripes on a beige top and blue bottom dress. The mismatched jewelry belt is not great, and the look overall should have been switched with the previous trench coat as I would have just skipped right over reviewing this look, but since it's last, I have to. It's ugly. Overall, not the strongest season from Anderson, but trying to bring his normally avant-garde brand into a more commercial lane wasn't the mess of an attempt some may have expected. He kept it weird, wacky, and just enough of a snooze fest to make it work. London Fashion Week most definitely wasn't the worst week of fashion month, but it definitely wasn't the best either. Some designers stuck to their guns in ways that worked and ways that didn't, and others seemed to want to keep calm and carry on with more commercial aspects of their lines. Undoubtedly, the best collection of the week goes to Simone Rocha, who reinstated house codes, updated references from iconic designers like Balenciaga, and made it all seem natural. The worst was naturally Burberry. Ricardo Tichy has the weight of the world on his shoulders, but evidently if he thinks that this was his strongest collection, he needs to go to the gym a bit more. So that is the end of the video. I would love to know what you guys think of all of the collections in the comments down below, and I appreciate you guys watching as always. So I will see you guys on the next one, and look out for the rest of our Fashion Month reviews. So with that, I'll see you guys soon, and TTYL.